go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people and you shall set limits for the people all around saying, take care not to go up into the mountain, touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. The idea of shot there is with an arrow. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near the mountain. Or, excuse me, do not go near alone. Uh, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this morning as we open your word. We ask that you would uh, be with us. And as we share with the children and they go to their ministry, uh, that you would be with them and equip them, Lord, to take the next step in their faith as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's read the question for the children. Question number 40. What should we pray? The answer, the whole word of God directs us in what we pray. So we take the direction from the whole word of God for our prayer life. The children are dismissed. What Moses has been told to, to do is to consecrate the people, which is basically to prepare them to meet with the Lord. And so uh, I've got a little introduction, which is a review of what we went over last week, and then we'll get into that uh, as uh, we are going along here. So last week we talked about being born, uh, the, the Hebrew people, he said, God told them, I bore you on eagle's wing." Uh, and I'm not going to go into detail about that other than the fact that that is a way of saying I delivered you from Egypt. In other words, I took you out of Egypt. I bore you on eagle's wings. I brought you to myself. God is making it clear that he is important, not only in control of the situation, but he's bringing the people to himself. And he basically is also saying I have chosen you, out of all the people of the world, and he later says that the world is all his, he says, I have chosen you. And what he has done is, is from the time that his promise with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, uh, he has been taking care of everything in such a way to protect the Hebrew people in order to protect and bring about the birth of Christ. And so we have that picture in our mind. We should have that as we're going through this to see all the amazing things that God does to separate the Hebrew people from the rest of the world with their faith, with their understanding of who he is, and he is their God. Also, I want you to see as we've been going through this, Moses is considered the mediator. In other words, he's the one that basically stands between them and God. He's the one that goes to hear, comes back, and, and delivers. And that is a type of Christ, who is our is the ultimate mediator. And we'll get into looking at that a little bit this morning as well. So I brought you to myself, God says, I chose you. And uh, if you are obedient, he says, and in, in earlier here in chapter 19 is if you are obedient I will bless you if you are obedient then I will bless you and it makes it sound like uh, you you can earn your salvation if you're obedient then I, you know you'll be saved if you are obedient I will bless you you're already my people I've already delivered you I've already shown you who you are but I if you I'm going to bless you as you follow my commands, it, 
it's going to make your life better. Things are, you know, he, he said, I'm going to bless you. You shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Again, that picture of this personal, intimate relationship with a people. This is the relationship that God has extended into the church today. As we confess God as our Father, Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit is as the one who teaches us, opens our hearts and opens our minds that indwells us. We are identifying with this as the people of God. And the promises that have been made are for us as well. We are a blessed people. And on top of that, we experience blessings here. And this same picture is if we are obedient, if we follow after the things of Christ, if we put it in order, God is going to walk with us in such a way that he will bless us. And someone will say, well, what about the martyrs? Were they blessed? Yes. You see, you hear some of the testimonies of them before they went to their death or even as they were dying. And you hear praise to God. And the thing that's happening is that the blessing that they had received was a transformation. They were no longer subject to the things of this world. So much so that they could agree with Paul. To live as Christ, to die as gain, I win. The worst thing the world can do is take away my life, and I win. So that's who we are. That's who God is bringing these people into understanding. He says, all the earth is mine, but you are my people. You are my treasured possession." And Israel's response to this, in verse 8 of chapter 19, was, Well, then all that you, the Lord, have spoken, we will do. Now, we know that they're not going to live up to that. But the reality is, is, is that, that, that there's this desire, and, and it needs to be our desire as well. Verse 9 is the is the line that cap is the verse that captivates me. Verse 9, chapter 19. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you, and you may also believe, they, they may also believe you forever. No other people have heard their God speak. He can't. Idols don't speak. Wooden images don't speak. God speaks to them and says, I'm coming to you and in a thick cloud and I'm going to speak and the people are going to hear. Now what they hear may not be uh, audible words in, 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 in complete understanding, but they're going to know that God spoke to Moses in such a way that they could know that God of all creation has spoken. Behold, I'm coming to you. I love that phrase. Verse 10. God speaks to Moses. He says, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. And let them wash their garments and be ready on the third day. To consecrate is to prepare them to meet me. He's telling them, I want you to prepare them to meet me. You have two days to get ready. Be ready on the third day. And I was trying to think of the different things in my lifetime where I've had the opportunity to entertain someone, whether it's family or friends or, or something, and, 
You know, you said, well, I've got a week to get ready. Or a vacation that's coming. I've got so much time to get ready. And the things that you do and, and the routines that you go through to prepare to have someone, especially if it's to have someone in your home, making sure that the, the kid's room has, has been cleaned up or that, that they might be using or, or the, the spare room is ready for them, however you would plan to house them. You, you make sure that the, you've been to the grocery store and you've got the foods and, you've, and if you've done your research right, you know what foods they like and you're, you want to please these people. You want to bless these people. And, and so uh, you want to prepare to, to meet them. And if it's a dignitary of some kind, all the more, you know, what do I say? What clothes do I wear? I uh, had the opportunity to meet the, the governor of California back in, in uh, the 60s and 70s, both. And uh, I knew that I was going to be sitting at a, at a table with him at a meal. And I was, you know, what do I wear? You know, I, would, I don't want to be overdressed. I don't want to be underdressed. Uh, I, I tend to lean on the casual side of things. And, and but, you know, it was, this was a suit and tie. So I made sure I had the right clothes and I even went out and bought a new suit. Uh, you know, I wanted it to be right. I, I wanted to fit in. I, I wanted to be a part of it. And, and so to consecrate is to prepare. Now, what they're preparing for is to come before the Lord as Moses ascends the mountain to hear the Lord speak. And the Lord has told them certain things to do. And, and first off, he says, you know, you've got two days to get ready. And on the third day, I'm coming to you. And, and concerning this meeting, he said, basically, he tells Moses to set limits on the people. Uh, for the and it's for their protection, by the way. What happens when someone gets into the presence of God that, in a, in a general format, that's, that's not prepared to to see Him, or He has not been directly invited to come into His presence? What happened with the high priest if he went behind into the Holy of Holies and had not prepared properly? Somebody say it. He died. To the point where after a while they actually put a, a cord around him and, and if, if he did, didn't come out after a while they knew to pull him out. People, you know, coming into the presence of God, he is holy. We cannot come face to face with him. Why? Because we are living in, in, in are encapsulated, if you will, in sinful bodies. Even Moses was hid behind a cleft in order to, to see the back of God. He is holy. It, it just the appearance of him is, is will, would take our life. He loves us. He created us. And so, even though sin is interfering with it, he wants us to, to be protected. He wants to take care of us. And so, for their protection, he's, told, he's telling them, don't go past this point. Don't go past the base of the mountain. If anyone does, the death sentence is on them. And I thought, man, that's so harsh. But the reason for that was to make sure that, that nobody did it. It never says that anybody did. But the reality is, is that if someone did, it would, it, it would quickly discourage the guy next to him. Uh, and, and that was the thing. God was protecting it as the, in, in a way that he put forth that they would uh, see and understand not to do this. Do not come up this mountain. No man can see the face of God and live. That's like I said, Moses even in the cleft, and later on in Exodus, uh, we talk about that. 
by the way, though, this changes. It changes through Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy. Second chapter. Paul writes, There is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself to the ransom. And this picture of Jesus Christ, the mediator, who is Jesus Christ? He is the Son of God. He is what? God in the flesh. We learn from John in his writings that he was, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then on, and that's the first verse of chapter, John chapter 1. The 14th verse says, and he became in the flesh. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've what? You've seen the Father. Okay, there's a transition going on. We're being brought into the family in such a way that we're, we're catching glimpses, but we're, we're invited to, to see what these people could not see. They were promised that it would happen, but they hadn't, couldn't see it themselves. We are such a blessed people. And so it says, later on, further on in verse 13 of chapter 19, when the trumpet sounds, they're to approach the mountain. When the trumpet sounds, there are to approach the mountain. So Moses went down, it says in verse 14. Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And one person pointed out something that I, you know, we don't think about. I'm sure we're aware of it once we think about it. How many changes of clothing did most of these people have? Probably the, what they had on. Some of them may have had more clothing than what they were wearing, and and that would have made them wealthy. I mean, it's, it's just the, you know like the clothing that they had on, and so they were to wash the, their clothing before they came to the mountain. They were to come, and, and this is a symbolic picture. The idea is, you are to look at you know to clean yourself. You are to become to God clean, uh, ready for this third day. And then the, the last thing he says to them is, the men were not to go near a woman. And what that meant was that they were not to have sexual relationships during this time. Not that there's anything wrong with a husband and a wife having sex. It's not has any doesn't have anything to do with that. It has to do with distraction. Your focus is to be on God and God only. And so this uh, is a focused approach, preparing to draw near to the Lord, should be taken seriously with forethought, with prayer. Self-examination. And so I was looking at some scriptures and, and, and trying to find one to share. And actually, I ended up coming to James in the fourth chapter. James uh, writes, starting with the seventh verse, Chapter 4, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. This is to be wretched, mourn and weep, in order to prepare ourselves to, to come before God. And looking at these and thinking, this is kind of 
been difficult to understand. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and He will exalt you. The idea of cleansing your hands here is the idea of stop sinning. Don't. This is the uh, this transition changing in Purify your heart. How do you purify your heart? You, know, you come before the Lord and you confess your sins, ask Him to cleanse your heart. The only thing I could think of was maybe to share Psalm 51, the picture of how to cleanse your heart. And to come before the throne of God, wretched, mourning, and weeping. Because what we're to wretched, be wretched, mourn, and weep is to understand God wretched. Why? Because I am a sinner. I have sinned. I am therefore wretched. And, 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 uh, and that's the idea of being, we don't want to use these words normally, but the. Uh, the Amazing Grace talks about the saved a wretch like me. Some people have actually, in their hymnals and in some churches, have changed that. And one like me. And, and this kind of thing. But the idea of wretch is to understand. Before the throne of God, I don't deserve to be there. I am a sinner. I am a wretched man. I am a sinner. I am to mourn over my sin. I am to weep over my sin. In other words, we are to take our sin seriously. It separates us from God. If we don't have Jesus Christ, it permanently separates us from God. But even in our lives uh, as, as believers, when we are in unconfessed sin, we are separated from God. So we are to mourn, to weep over the condition of our sinfulness and the sinfulness of the world we live in. What we are to do in the context of this is to admit you are a sinner, to be un and that you are able to save yourself. You need someone to save you. Psalm 51 in reference to a heart. David writes, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgression." Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now listen carefully. He says, for I know my transgressions. He's aware of his sin. He knows what they are. He says, it's before me. It's forever before me. Against you only have I sinned. Now, some people have a rough time with that because he, that we know of the sins with Bathsheba and, and how it impacted others. He says, oh, yeah, before you only. And the idea of this is that the way he's speaking about sin here is the sin that separates me from God. Against you I have sinned foremost and, 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 and I am separated when, it, when it's not forgiven. And I've done what's evil in your sight so that, it may, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. In other words, I have, no matter, I could sin against Ted, and that wouldn't be a sin against somebody else, but it still would be a sin against God. And so, Lord, you know my sins, I know my sins, and you are alone are the one who can repair it. He asks the Lord later on in the same psalm, 
Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from my from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. And and so he's basically saying, Deliver me from sin, that I might share with others your mercy and your grace. We are called to be people who have been delivered from their sin to share. God's mercy and grace with others. Not only to extend it, that's part of it. In other words, to extend it to, to others, but to declare it as well. And and to be ones who share. Does that mean we go around with, with our Bibles and you know beat the people over the head with it, so to speak? Uh, no. And it has nothing to do quite candidly with with marching and demanding your rights in, in, in Washington, D.C., or anything else. Not that you can't do that, or that you shouldn't do that. You can't legislate morality. Morality comes from a person who has confessed Jesus Christ. And that's where it is. And we, and we come before God, we confess our sins, we ask Him to deliver us, and we stand with Him. And I have a picture that I so love. I'm sure over the year you, you might get, you know, not well, I will not get tired of the year again. Uh, it's Zechariah chapter 3. And it's one of the most powerful pictures of God's grace in my mind. Then he, the angel that was escorting me, Zechariah showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is, is Jesus. So we have Joshua the high priest standing before Jesus. And and it's before the the judgment throne is implied, and it says, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. So here's the basic picture. I'm standing before the judge, the angel of the Lord, and standing next to me is Satan, who is there to accuse me. He doesn't say anything about my defense attorney. Because I don't need one. He was standing there to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand that plucked, I plucked from the fire? In other words, this is, this is one I have plucked from the fire. One of my, I have delivered him. You have nothing to say, Satan. You've seen in some kind, maybe a, a cartoon picture, Satan with a role standing before somebody of a list of things. We all have a substantial role. Uh, and, and Satan could start at, 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 at well, Bob, when he was three years old, knew that this was something he shouldn't do. So there's his first, you know, accountability, and go on from there. When he hid himself in the closet and lit the straw, thinking he was smoking a cigarette and set the house on fire. Yeah. All these different things that, that I did even as a child, knowing that it was wrong. So there, there's no shortage of things that Satan has on him. And so he's standing there, and I feel like he's standing there with the, with the list, ready to go. You know, and, and, and as... The, the angel of the Lord, as the Lord starts speaking, and, and he says, rebuke you, Satan, and, and, and basically be quiet. You have nothing to say. And, and Satan over here, but, but, but Bob did, but, but Bob did, but, but, uh, he's guilty. And 
And Jesus said, I forgive him. His sins are as far as the east is from the west. He's forgiven. Look what he does. Now Joshua would have standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, the filthy garments representing his sin. By the way, coming back to the Hebrew people, washing their clothes was a symbolic picture of cleansing, confessing their sin. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken away your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestures. I'll give you new clothing, super for being in my presence. They put a clean turban on him, and it goes on. And the angel of the Lord assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Jesus Christ, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge over my courts, and I will give you the right to access among those who are standing there. I just, I, I think of this and I go on and see what Christ did to purchase it. So that when I stand there, Satan is, is completely out of the picture for all intents and purposes. He can holler all he wants, he can, he can object all he wants, and it's not even noted. The court record, so to speak, says, and Jesus loved Bob and forgave him. There's nothing about the accusation. They don't exist. One of the places where we are told to take this kind of account to ourselves is when we share in communion. Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Examine himself. Then, and so to eat the communion, and so to eat of the bread and to drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. In other words, when we come to communion, we are to come prepared to take. How does that mean prepared? Acknowledging who Christ is. In fact, I, I was taught by a mentor before I ever went to Bible college uh, in, in uh, the Tascadero where Kathy and I went to, first went to church. And uh, he says, we should pray for God, to, you know, before we ever get to church, for God to prepare our hearts to receive. <laughs> For God to reveal to us the things that stand between us and Him, that we might confess them before we ever sit down in church in order to have those things removed as barriers, as, as distractions. To pray that God would remove all distractions, good and bad, if you will, in order for us to receive from His Word the things that we need to hear today. And it's what's amazing then is as we come in here, what I hear from God's word, where we're both listening to the same message and the same scriptures, I might receive a whole different picture than you might receive. Because the Holy Spirit is working in my life where I'm at. 
and he's working in your life where you're at. And so this, this idea of, of looking at this is, is that as we hear the word of God, as we've gone through it together, now I have the opportunity to examine my heart. And that's what we're told to do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That a person examine himself. And then eat of the bread. And so what we do here. Is we have the opportunity through a song. To give you that opportunity one more time before you share in the communion. To examine. To look. To be right with God. Ask the Lord to open your eyes to your sin or anyone that you might have offended and that you would like to heal that relationship. These types of things. All of that is tied to being here together, to worship together, uh, to come alongside each other, to pray and, and to, to share the things that God has given us. His word, communion. We confess our sins. We seek His forgiveness. We have two trays up here. One is, is a packet. You remove the top, to, the bread is, is there. And then you remove the second lid, and the cup is exposed. And then we have on this side two cups that are stacked in each other with the bottom of them. Contains the bread, uh, and the top one contains, contains the cup. And while we are singing, we ask you to come forward to pick up the communion, uh, and then uh, return to your seats, hold it until we've all been served, and we finish the song. And we'll share. Who was and is and is to come 
Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all Praise to the King of Kings You are my everything And I will adore you Holy, holy, holy Is the Lord God Almighty Who was and is and is to come With all creation I sing Praise to the King of Kings You are my everything And I will adore you Chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes to them, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink it, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Father, we thank you that you have given us these emblems to remind us of who you are and what you have done. You are the Lord of all creation. You became a part of creation in order to save us, to deliver us from our sin. We worship you. We thank you. We ask that you would cause us to be truly in awe of who you are. And as we go today, we ask, Lord, that you would go with us in such a way that we would live our lives for you and to be bold enough to share when given the opportunity with someone else how awesome it is to know that what separates us from God our sins have been forgiven and cast into the deepest sea. Thank you. Go with us now. Be with us. We worship you. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing it with amazing grace? Amazing grace.